Your mind is creating everything about the world around you. Every relationship around you is also being created by your mind. In fact, the people around you can be elevated by your mind or they can be pulled down. That is how powerful your mind is. Whatever you believe about the world becomes true for the world. Do you remember that story with Sarah Madani yesterday? Sarah spoke about how a eating disorder that she had was healed in a one hour hypnotherapy session with Marissa Peer. Now what's going on in a situation like that is that hypnotherapy is going into your subconscious and making you believe something new about the world. What you believe about the world often becomes what is true for the world. In my book, The Buddha and the Badass, I call this the act of identity shifting. What we're gonna do here is I'm gonna teach you how to self-hypnotize yourself. You're going to learn a protocol in this presentation to craft new identities for yourself related to health or wellness or experiencing life with ease. And then you're going to learn how to implant those identities in your mind. And the implantation process is so fast, so quick, so easy, even though it sounds so disturbing when I say implantation process, that you are going to see results really fast. We're going to show you essentially how to master your mind. Now to understand this, the first thing you got to understand is this concept. In my book, The Code, uh, The Buddha and the Badass, I wrote this quote down. The universe acts as a mirror. It reflects back to you what you are. The miracle of this is that you can shift your identity and the world will obey. The universe will not give you what you want, but will reflect back to you who you are. Now let me explain further. This idea came because around 2019 in May, we were hosting a big Mind Valley event in Portugal. It's called A-Fest. And one of the speakers who was on stage then was this amazing man, Reverend Michael Beckwith. So we were having breakfast one morning, just discussing how the day was gonna unfold. And Michael Beckwith is the individual who has been in more documentary films than any other teacher of wisdom. He was also in the movie, The Secret. So I said, Michael, it's been 20 years since that movie, That Secret. Given everything you've learned right now, would you teach anything differently? And he said, absolutely, Vishen. I would teach that the law of attraction is incomplete. In fact, the law of attraction is actually probably not going to work for most people. And Beckwith went on to say this, the more important thing is the law of resonance. The universe will not give you what you want. It will reflect back to you who you are. What this means is that what you believe to be true about yourself will be reflected back to you by the universe. We're gonna put this aside for a second and I'm gonna go into how we grow. And then we're gonna come back to the law of resonance and you're gonna see how this connects. We grow in terms of transformational theory, two things. We grow by shifting our models of reality. So our models are what we believe about the world. So somebody who believes that the world is painful and tough will experience a world that's painful and tough. You believe in a world of abundance, you will experience abundance. If you think about your mind as a computer, computers have hardware and software. This is one of the early Macintosh computers, hardware and software. Your models of reality are like your hardware. Your systems for living are like your software. So what are systems for living? It's your diet, it's what you eat, it's maybe your sleep ritual, it is what you learn culturally in terms of raising your child, it's the exercise routine that you do, it's your procedure for kickstarting your day when you get to work. These are all systems that you learn. Many people focus on systems. So we go to a gym, we take yoga classes, all of these are systems. The systems, however, are the software. We forget to look at the hardware. The hardware is what actually causes the change. So let me give you an example. This is Jim Quick. So when Jim Quick gets on stage and he gives you a new model of reality, when Jim Quick says creativity is not something you have, it's something you do, he's working on your hardware. He's giving you a new belief about creativity. That is a model of reality. When Marissa Peer hypnotizes someone, she's implanting in them a new belief. That is a hardware shift. So just like in old computers, you can take out a hard drive that maybe is too small and put in a more powerful hard drive you can take out beliefs that don't serve you and put in healthier beliefs. Now, let's talk about systems. When Jim Quick does his squatting thing, that's a system, it's a practice. When you study yoga, when you do 10X, when you take up WildFit, all of these are systems. Systems are habits, but models of reality are beliefs. Going back to the analogy of the computer, what we are seeking to do is to continually upgrade your computer, to go from an early Mac to a modern Mac. But to do this, it's not just about the software, it's not about the apps you install, the diet that you take on. It is about what are your fundamental ideas about the world 
that you believe and are convinced are true. If you change that, that is the most important trigger for transformation. Any of you guys heard of this book, Psycho Cybernetics by Maxwell Maltz? This book was written in the 80s and uh, my dad's in the audience. This was one of the books that I found on my dad's bookshelf that completely changed my life. So Maxwell Maltz was a plastic surgeon and he found that when he gave someone a nose job, he changed even the slightest thing about their appearance that their friends didn't notice. So he would adjust something about a person's nose. Even their friends or their mother wouldn't notice, but they would feel different. And all of a sudden, they would start getting promotions in their career. All of a sudden, they would start dating the person of their dreams. What exactly was going on? So Maxwell Maltz went on to say, it's no exaggeration to say that every human being is hypnotized to some extent, either by ideas he has uncritically accepted from others or ideas he has repeated to himself and convinced himself to be true. We all are hypnotized, but we don't know we're hypnotized. So here's another really fascinating study. Now, this one was really intriguing. How many of you here slap on cologne or perfume when you go out? Okay. Great. The people who raise their hands, those of you who are not raising your hands, sniff them. See how good they smell. Like, learn from them. The rest of you smelly buggers might want to consider learning a new system, spraying on cologne. Okay, so spraying on cologne is a system. But there's an interesting belief associated with that as well. And it turns out that the belief is more powerful than the system. So in this study, they took men and they had men walk into a room and stand in front of a camera and just introduce themselves. Now, these men who were introducing themselves in the camera, they were being shown on video to women and women had to rate the men in order of attractiveness. Now, they did one little twist. There were certain men who, as they walked into the room, they were asked, they were given a really expensive cologne and they are saying, spray this on. This is so good. Look at this brand. Just spray this cologne on. It'll make you feel good. Now, it turns out that the man who had sprayed on the cologne on camera was shown, were deemed to be more attractive by women. It's as if spraying on the cologne gave them a new identity of attractiveness. The women were watching this on a, on a screen. They could not smell the men but the men felt different when they sprayed on cologne. How many of you here feel different when you spray on cologne or perfume? How many of you here feel different when you wear a suit? This is why I wear suits. I just found that I perform better when I'm training or in a business setting when I wear suits. These little things change our beliefs. Even though someone may not be able to smell your cologne, there are subtle things that you're doing differently that cause them to deem you as more attractive. The belief, however, the model of reality is more powerful than the actual system, which is the act of spraying on. So if any one of you read the book Sapiens by Yuval Hariri, Yuval says the difference between us and animals is that human babies are like molten glass. They can be molded and shaped into anything. This is why a child can grow up to be a peacemaker or a warmonger, a Buddhist or a Christian or a Muslim, rich or poor, we shape our little baby humans with beliefs from the time they are young. And many of you are carrying the beliefs that were implanted in you by your parents from as early as being in the womb. So here's another crazy study, fit hotel mates. So in this study, the researchers were wondering why is it that so many hotel mates in the United States are clinically obese and have really bad health even though if you actually look at their job, they are running up and down stairs, they are flipping over mattresses, they are vacuuming, they're actually taking 10,000 steps a day. So they created this fake research project, they interviewed the maids, and they were just, the, the hypothesis of the project is that, as far as the maids thought, is that these researchers wanted to measure their health and well-being for insurance. But at the end of asking these maids questions, the researcher said this, wow, Matilda, did you know that based on what you're telling me, you are walking 10,000 steps a day and doctors say that is really good. You must feel so healthy. You are doing such great things for your body. That's it. Now, one month later, they go back and they check the maids and their health biomarkers. All the maids who were given that statement were suddenly healthier. You see, these maids in their mind never saw vacuuming or walking upstairs or hurling or making a bid as exercise. But when the researcher told them to see it as exercise, all of a sudden their bodies responded. So it turns out it's not even the exercise you do, it's do you 
perceive what you do as exercise. Now, this is not an excuse to say, I'm going to eat peanut butter and jelly sandwiches every day, and the act of chewing that sandwich is exercise. There are limitations, right? But if you tell yourself that as I walk, as I pace, I, I take calls from home, as I pace, and I'm on on my airports in a meeting, I am giving my body the exercise it needs, your body will respond. Now, it turns out that it doesn't, your beliefs don't just affect you, they will affect everyone around you. Remember that story of how men became more attractive, even on camera when they spray on cologne? Same thing is true for a woman when she does her hair or when she puts something on, but your beliefs affect other people. What you believe about someone else will affect how they show up to you. If you believe your partner is lazy, he, is, he or she is more likely to be lazy. If you believe something about your child, they are more likely to reflect that. This is really weird. 1968 Pygmalion Effect Experiment. So what happened is they lied to teachers. They told teachers that Tom, Ali, and Sarah in their class were gifted students, that they had aced this incredible exam on IQ. And they told the teachers, you are not allowed to teach to treat them any differently. You're not allowed to tell them that they are gifted. Just know that they are gifted. At the end of the academic year, Tom, Ali, and Sarah scored grades way higher than all of the other students. Something about the teacher's expectation of the child actually influenced the child. What does this tell you about how you see your kids? Even how you see your boyfriend and girlfriend? How you expect someone to respond, what you expect of people, literally creates them. Your mind is creating everything about the world around you. Every relationship around you is also being created around by your mind. In fact, the people around you can be elevated by your mind or they can be pulled down. That is how powerful your mind is. So in the book Atomic Habits, the author, James Clear, shares another really fascinating psychological experiment. How many of you here have trouble going to the gym? Raise your hand. It's okay, no one's judging. We all have trouble, including me, right? I was so busy this past weekend, I missed two gym sessions. But that's unusual. Usually, I love going to the gym because I adopted this mental trick from James Clear. So James said this, there are three ways to create a desire, a habit, a movement. The first is outcome. Outcome means you tell yourself, I want to lose five kilograms. And he says, that's okay. Some people are going to be motivated by that to go to the gym. But outcome-based desires, not very effective. There will be mornings when you will wake up and you'll go, oh man, it's so, so cold outside and I didn't sleep well. And Christina says, I need to practice self-love. So I'm going to love myself in bed and keep myself warm. That's outcome, right? Not very effective. Then there's process. Process is you tell yourself, I'm going to go to the gym two times a week, practice the 10X protocol for precisely 20 minutes each. It's better. You're more likely to go to the gym, but it's not the most effective. The most effective is an identity. An identity, says James Clear, is you tell yourself, I have the body of an athlete and my body loves to work out. If you embrace that identity to the point where you start believing it, you will never miss a gym session. You just can't. Because when you wake up in the morning, as tired as you are, you will feel this impulse that your body loves to work out. It turns out identity hacking is the best way to install a habit. So back to Michael Beckwith, the universe will not give you what you want. Rather, it will reflect back to you what you are. This is not just spiritual beliefs. This is now proven in science. As James Clear mentioned, identity hacking is the best way to create any type of behavior. So I want to share with you seven identities that I believe we need to take on. Seven enhanced models of reality that if you walk out of this door today, your entire life will change. Are you guys ready? So the first one is this, discipline. Discipline is the idea that you do better when you're happy. So if you're having a stressful day and if you're feeling a little bit sad, don't pour yourself back into work. Do something to elevate happiness. There's a lot of research right now that says that happiness fuels productivity. 
Salespeople sell 55% better when they're happy. Doctors are 19% better at diagnoses when they're happy. There's a remarkable, a remarkable book on this called The Happiness Advantage. Discipline is the discipline that your bliss is the most important thing. And I want to share with you a really interesting um, series of lessons on discipline. Let me read you this poem, one of my favorite poems ever. I was early thought to work as well as play. My life has been one long happy holiday, full of work, full of play. I dropped the worry on the way, and God was good to me every day. This poem sounds like it was written by a 19-year-old. It's super simplistic, seems very innocent, right? Life was been one long happy holiday, really, really? Your life has always been a happy holiday, full of work and full of play. This guy sounds like he's just not the most productive person you want to hire in your company. Never worried, drop the worry along the way. God was good to me every day, seriously. Believing in God, that's like so like 19th century. But it turns out this poem was actually written by John D. Rockefeller, the richest man who ever lived in the last 150 years, richer even than Elon Musk. He wrote this poem at 86. You see, we think that hard work, that hustle, that the grind is what it takes successful. John Rockefeller didn't. Look at his words. He had the right beliefs about reality. Work and play, equally important. Drop the worry, because God has your back. The theory of the benevolent universe. So what you believe about the world is going to gift you. Now, this is a lesson I learned recently when I was interviewing Mustafa Salamer, who lives here in Dubai. So he is one of only 20 people in the world who has skied to the North and South Pole and climbed all seven of the tallest mountains on the seven continents, right? Maria came very close, but Mohammed Salamir is one of 20 who did that. And I asked him, you know, when you're, he's almost died so many times. And I said, when you're pushing yourself in these uncomfortable situations in the sheer cold and the agony of a blizzard, what keeps you going? And he said, bliss. When I, I, I look at where I am, I look at the pain, the, 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 fierceness of nature and I just feel happiness in there. I learned that from my Sufi training. See happiness in everything you do. And that's how I became one of only 20 people to accomplish this. And by the way, this man grew up in a refugee camp. He worked five years washing dishes. He's basically a dishwasher, a Palestinian refugee dishwasher who got a job at a restaurant in London, washing dishes for five years, couldn't speak any English, and today, he's one of the world's greatest explorers.